Thank you guys for being here for this uh, new season of the Periodic Seminars. Today I have the honor to introduce uh, Mubarak, Mubarak uh, Atetunji Ojiwa. He will be talking about uh, the subject on big data management in IoT applications. To say a few words on Mubarak, he's a young and new PhD student at the lab. Uh, Ojiwal is, um, he holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of uh, Baden with the first, with the first class on, honor in 2014. And a master's degree in computer science from the African University of Science and Technology in Abuja, Nigeria. We can also mention that uh, he served as a graduate teaching assistant at uh, the Dahaba, Dahaba uh, State University, uh, also in Nigeria, in, uh, in 2014. So, uh, Mubarak, you will have around 30 minutes to entertain us on this inter interesting subject. And uh, you guys, feel free to interrupt him uh, in the talk to put a few questions if you want. Okay. <coughs> okay, so uh, Patrick did the introduction already, and uh, please, uh, I would like to mention that please don't interrupt until I'm done with this, eh? so we don't spoil the flow before someone asks a very difficult question. So, um, <coughs> so uh, this happened to be my master's thesis, uh, as some of you may have guessed. Uh, I worked on big data management in uh, IoT applications, and uh, I'll be taking you through this for some 30 minutes. So we'll go, <clears throat> we'll explain the research context, the problem statements, then uh, some related work, of course, then the, the methodology, the proposed approach for data management, then use some use case illustrations on the conclusion. So. <coughs> Um, for those people that are not Portuguese, I'm sure everyone must have taken a flight down here. So if you took a Boeing 787, during your flight, you have at least five, you have created at least 500 gigabytes of data. So imagine the number of people flying every day. So all flights online has an average of about 500 gigabytes of data in say just one, two, three hours of our flight. So <clears throat> to put this into perspective, at the rate at which it generates data, there are about 45,000 Uber drives, then we stream over 450, we tweet over 456,000 tweets per minute on Twitter, 45,000 Uber drives, then we have uh, 46,000 videos on Instagram and a lot of this. And all these are well put into perspective by <coughs> this American computer scientist, Anthony Ortinger, who says, computers have promised us a fountain of wisdom, but delivered only a flood of data. So, <coughs> the research contest. What, I was, what we are saying in essence is that the Internet of Things connects all manners of end endpoints devices and this creates a huge amount of uh, data. Ubiquitous network and device proliferation enable us to have a uh, massive uh, uh, amount of data. We give us insights into things we, can, we could never imagine knowing before. And uh, analytics and for our business intelligence tools empower us to make use of this data to make our uh, intelligent decisions. So <clears throat> in summary, IoT creates huge amount of big data and analytics is needed for this data to make it useful. So, <clears throat> so why is this problem interesting? Why are we doing it? Because uh, in IoT application, IoT applications are typically real-time applications. Then in real-time application, time is money in the best case. And it may even be more costly than money in some instances. So when uh, an IoT actionable event occurs, this is the process, the data is loaded for analytics, then the analytics happen, then the decision is communicated back to where actions is needed. So we can see a lot of uh, latency 
time loss is a uh, value loss. So I want to reduce the time of taking a business action after a business event occur. So <clears throat> the problem statement is we seek to develop a generic approach to process high velocity heterogeneous data typical of IoT applications to reduce latency of intelligent reaction to actionable events <clears throat> and demonstrate this approach with a use case scenario. So <clears throat> I found this picture very interesting. This is a uh, this is, this represents uh, the traditional way we the traditional way we think about data. The traditional way we think about database. We believe data needs to be stored in a database then processed and forward. So it's represented with uh, this little, uh, little chap trying to storing the data in the bottom then before processing. But data stream applications, typical of IoT devices, are fast moving data where you have to generate uh, this, where you have to derive value from high, fast, high moving data. So <clears throat> this is more of what we have right now. As the data is moving, you have to get uh, value from the uh, data. And this makes the problem of dealing with IoT data much more interesting. It's a diff completely different way of how we think about uh, normal big data in other applications. So in this case, it is not very advisable. You first store data in Hadoop, then you try to process it in some Apache, Stack, Storm, and all of way. So <clears throat> these are some work done on IoT, uh, IoT data management before. So can uh, at all, they, they came up with a cloud-based data management application and analysis using Hadoop and Stack. So the result was that Apache Spark, which is a stream uh, processing framework, is much more better than Hadoop, as Hadoop incurred more over it, apparently. So Kodadi and all, uh, et al. also proposed a framework for development and deployment of IoT application focusing on data collection, load balancing, and some, somewhat of data preprocessing. So their approach is also more on uh, data collection and nothing about get, making intelligent decisions faster. So the same thing about Zoo et al. proposed a common interface model to make our uh, heterogeneous data more homogeneous. You know, we have data from sensors, we have data from your fridge, your mobile phone. So to make them somewhat more homogeneous for you to uh, process them together. Then uh, Abu El Khair et al. provided layer stages of data management. I, th I think they provided about six layers of uh, data management here. I believe this will even, rather than reduce latency, it adds more to the latency. Then, Chechenil and uh, all Andrews IoT big data issues such as se uh, sensor heterogeneity and reconfiguration capabilities. Then Rhodes wrote, uh, Rhodes wrote a very nice article in 2016 about big, uh, management of big data. He suggested technology tools and protocols for so, uh, solutions to process, uh, to process data right from devices to IoT software. Then the Lambda architecture is a very popular architecture for managing streaming data analytics. So the, data, uh, the Lambda architecture provides uh, an approach to data management where you have uh, real-time data management, then you have streaming analytics for long-term intelligence at the same time, and both happening in the cloud. <coughs> so <coughs> this is generally the existing approach to data management. So you have a business IoT real-time events happening, then the reaction, the uh, event is sent to the Cloud Big Data Platform. Then some analytics is completed. Then decision and actuations are sent back to your IoT devices application. So <clears throat> sometimes in uh, 2016 or 2014, uh, Cisco proposed uh, fog computing for IoT data management. Like, guys, let's change the way we think about this. Rather than sync all the data from IoT applications, rather than sync all the data from IoT real-time applications to cloud big data analytics. So why not undo some of this uh, using edge computing, also known as fog computing? So data from my phone, from the uh, projector, and some of your phones can be handled, say, by a processor here situated at the door. Then data from the next building can be handled somewhere close there then real-time decisions can be made at this point back then before we sync the data to the cloud. 
So, and <clears throat> I find this approach very, very uh, interesting. But the only why are uh, the the little uh, the addition where I think the point I see in this is that it's not talking about how or the the how this intelligence made on the fog layer at this fog edge can be much more intelligent. You know, you can always program uh you can always program your fog layer to react in a specific way to an IoT device. But what if you want to incorporate say mind intelligence from big data on the fog layer? And so that is what uh that is that was what motivated the proposed approach. So <clears throat> we are saying in this work that we will leverage fog computing for IoT data management, but we want to introduce mind intelligence from big data analytics and we provide a mechanism where all this data will be aggregated and sent to the cloud big data platform so that mind intelligence from historical data will be available at the fog uh, edge, at the edge computing layer for intelligent real time actions. So we basically broke down the communication. So we leverage my intelligence from big data from at the fog layer and make intelligent action. And intelligent fog increases the capabilities and widens the application area for computing in IoT application. If you can incorporate uh, the mind intelligence from the at the fog layer, then it increases the possibilities of uh, the things IoT applications can do. And uh, Concurrent device to fog and fog to cloud uh, uh, back and forth communication. So what we basically did is, from the previous slide, we broke this communication between the device and the fog into two. So for real-time decision making and for real-time applications, so you only need to communicate with the fog layer back and forth. Then for historical data and stream applications, then you only need to do this communication. So these two communications can happen concurrently and it makes decision making faster and latency is greatly reduced. So, <clears throat> so some use case application of this scenario. So we, <clears throat> we uh, modeled a patient monitoring system where it needs to give uh, some sort of alarm when the patient is probably is heading towards, the, based on the readings you sense that the patient is heading towards an unstable condition. So you don't need to get to the cloud to do this. It can be done from the devices and it can, medical history and likely complications of the uh, patient can be added to the device probably uh, just, uh, the device just uh, beside the bed of the patient. So we also uh, proposed another use case application. So this is a smart cities uh, system monitoring traffic situation. So uses, it uses predictive analytics to predict road conditions and uh, monitors, um, monitors the, and decide the best route to follow in a traffic situation based on the state of the junction and the state of nearby junction. So you have uh, the normal decision fog computing with mind historical intelligence to make real time uh, decisions. Then. Uh, yeah, we have a third one. We have a third use case model that's uh, application requesting ads. So you know something funny happened when I got to uh, when I got to Portal. You know, uh, after paying for my flight with my credit card and I got to Portal, just uh, when I connected to the Wi-Fi at the guest house where I was staying, the next thing I started seeing accommodation adverts on all the apps I opened. So this is uh, this is actually it, this is the Internet of Things at work, and uh, this is how pervasive our life is becoming. Due to my transactions online and my movement geolocation data, then Google is able to uh, to serve me adverts that are relevant to what I need right now. So it's basically the same thing. User interest uh, is is the mind in historical intelligence here with normal fog uh, fog computing variables to make real-time intelligence on ads to be served to uh, devices. So <clears throat> I left the uh, implementation part uh, of this work out of the presentation deliberately because uh, I unfortunately the code was backed up. I was not using Git up then apparently. So the code was backed up on an hard disk that I lost and uh, 
while I got some screenshots, I still have the screenshots of the uh, performance. I think I lost the screenshot of the benchmark. There was a mix mix up. So the benchmark against the uh, performance was not complete. But basically what we did was we tried to model an ad serving application and uh, we modeled it without user interest and with added user interest and we found out that when you add mind histori historical intelligence to decision making at the fog layer you did not you do not necessarily in, uh, incur significant latency overhead <clears throat> so conclusion we propose a new approach to iot data management the new approach aims to help iot application make more intelligent decisions with no significant added latency and we illustrated three IoT use cases. So, future uh, recommendation on this approach is that careful selection of stream processing tools on the cloud platform and fast from communication infrastructure, fast internet, uh, especially for between the cloud and the fog and between the fog and the devices. Then, future work should more work on demonstration and testing of this approach and investigation as investigation to more efficient IoT data management in the cloud layer data ingestion analysis and all. So, grassi, obrigado. <laughs> so many thanks for the talk. We have room for a few questions. Can you, can you go back to your use case two? Um? Can you go back to your use case two? The, the second one. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So, so what I understood is fog is kind of a middle man between your big data, which will have the stoic data, the data over, let's say, 10 days of a whole system, and there is fog which have the real time applications of the data. Mm -hmm. but, but like, uh, I'm trying to understand how does fog not, like, you, you use some words like latency. How does fog does not get affected by by the latency by study data? For example, in 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 a lot of tasks in IoT, you need the historical data to make the decisions. The algorithms need something from the historical data. May not the may not, it may not be the whole yes. historical data. It may be a conclusion from this work. So mm -hmm. how does that not play into fog? Like does fog like fog is limited to only right now, or does it take some information from some kind of clear to me. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> thank you for the question. So the uh, there are two or three issues with that. The first thing is that the fog itself, the fog computing itself, ap uh, applies to a wide variety of uh, equ uh, equipment, hardware. Your mobile phone is an edge device, but can still also add, uh, act as a fog layer for computing. When you are trying to uh, when you are trying to store this uh, mind in intelligence in say form of a cache in the browser, so in this case, your even the device itself is still ad acting as the uh, edge device as but the default. But the intelligence you are talking about, just, just sorry, but the intelligence you are talking about, we are doing about intelligence. But where does the intelligence is driven from? It's driven from the the big data, the cloud data. Yes, but what 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 I'm saying is this: what I'm trying to drive at is that four devices typically have a low computation power. They are not as powerful as big data platforms. So what we are proposing is like making simple, intelligent decisions using uh, this user interest. You do not need to mine this user interest; it's already there, cached in the fog layer. So the fog is not doing the computation of the mining of the historical intelligence. It's only making use of the available mined intelligence to make okay. a decision at its layer. So it, it, it does not take account the, the historical data at all? No, no, it does. What the fog does is uh, in the main approach again. So basically what the fog does is this. It aggregates this data, this historical data over time and send it to the cloud platform. And the cloud platform in return worked on, worked on this data and get some insights of my historical intelligence and make it available to the fog. And the fog incorporate this 
data in decision real time decision making and this exchange does not affect the real time no the, no 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 the, if the communication has been broken into two concurrent sites okay. so the communication between the cloud and the cloud does not affect the cloud and the device okay thank you yeah. so, so next uh, can i make any comments slash questions okay uh, so uh, as far as i understand this idea about of computing is that it's not actually something new. I mean, it's something that probably has been done before, at least in good engineering. Yes. But uh, these guys from Cisco thought it would be nice just to call it fog computing. <laughs> <laughs> because honestly, what I see and what I understand from this is that basically what you're doing with fog computing is uh, instead of depending solely on the cloud computing to carry out your decision process and to process your data, to store everything, you are uh, keeping some of this data or the most immediate part of it in your uh, <coughs> local storage. Right? Exactly. The user, so that you can also have better control over the quality of service that you are providing. That is the objective. That, that is the objective, to reduce so latency. This was done, has always been done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it hasn't been done, uh, I was actually, uh, because imagine if you have, uh, in, for instance, in one of the projects that I'm working on, you have some use case that is about detecting uh, uh, cars and uh, the traffic lights in a, in a crossroad. And uh, you have to make decisions upon the, the approaching, approaching traffic and uh, on the flow of the traffic and also change the actuator over the traffic lights. Mm -hmm. And this is done with uh, some cameras and some other sensors that they have. And uh, I think this would only have changed from the initial, from, from this strategy to cloud computing because purely out of bad engineering practice because there were some guys that said, oh, let's put everything up to the cloud. But when you already put all of this information up to the cloud, then you lose obviously control over uh, the processing times and a lot of other stuff. So this guy said, okay, oh, so let's go back. Now let's call this for, for computing and let's place some, some um, equipment in the middle that can make this decision faster and uh, at least with some uh, explicit, explicit deadlines, right? Yes. And then we call it for computing. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I agree. The approach. I, I'm not wrong. This is, a, this is the common kind of stuff that I have to, to make. Okay. And now to the question part, and the question is something like this. So, um, in that connection between your uh, sensors or your devices, your IoT devices, so being Sorry. sensors or actuators doesn't matter, uh, in that connection between these devices and the fog computing device, uh, assuming that it's an external device, obviously, and not like in a mobile phone case. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of middleware do you, uh, do you use? Do, does it provide some kind of quality of service control? Do you use DDS, for instance, or something like that? Because if you don't use it, how do you control uh, the quality of service of your connection? Okay, um, so I say it IoT depends. and the fog computing. Okay. What kind of middleware should be here? Yeah. I say it no, depends. No, you know, so between the IoT devices and the fog computing. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so exactly, it depends on the application. Mm -hmm. Some application can make use of the devices itself, uh, device itself as the fog, as the uh, edge computing device, like I mentioned in the case of the ads having a mobile phone. Probably the cache of the browser can store mining historical intelligence. Mm -hmm. Then, in this case, the devices are the edge, com are, uh, edge devices themselves. But let's say uh, the patient monitoring system, for example, you can have a device beside the patient's bed that actually syncs with the patient record on the cloud and uh, also uh, interact with the patient's current real time readings to trigger an alarm if there should be an uh, unstable condition. Mm -hmm. so so I'm assuming then that there is no standardization how you connect it, right? It's no, there, no, there, no, there is not. This is like, the specification of your yeah, this is like an approach to think about <coughs> building IoT uh, oh, applications. It's conceptual. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, just a little bit of a comment on what Ricardo said. Uh, yes, we have uh, in communications, we tend to create new terms 
<laughs> something that we have done before, right? Even the Internet of Things is your senses connected to the Internet, right? <laughs> yes. Or a traitor, right? But I think there's also, there's always a little bit uh, uh, of innovation, right? Because before, uh, you didn't have all this uh, framework of cloud computing, and now it becomes more relevant to have something uh, um, and next to the premises of the enter well, but um, just just to make a comment on that, that yes, we tend to put new names, right? Sometimes this gives more commercial. Uh, it is more like a marketing campaign to make it more attractive, right? And we have done things in the past. Uh, it doesn't uh, mean that it's not completely new. There are some aspects that are new, and I think it's important to uh, to see what is really new, what was in the past and to come up with uh, uh, a nice nice proposal. And now, my question is, to be honest, I didn't know this term, for, for computing, uh, before your presentation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't know what is the, uh, why fog, you know? I understand the concept that, you, like Ricardo said, you have the cloud computing and now you need to go back because... Because it's not dense. It's not yeah. dense. It's, it's not dense. dense. You know, if cloud, cloud is dense, then the fog is, fog is not as dense as the flows are, yeah. And it's near to the ground. And it's near to the ground. Right? Okay, thank you. All right. So instead of the blue nimbus clouds, you have something? Yes. Okay, we are not getting smarter in the term. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I'm still a bit playing to catch up with mm -hmm. understanding this because it's, uh, you pointed out that I heard about it before, but I don't know. You, in the ad sense, the ad use case, you said that the mobile devices can act as a phobia as well. So, so just to understand, in, in, like, not from a technical level, what is the difference or what is the, the similarities between cookies, what cookies do in a browser, and what fog layer would do in a smartphone? What the oh, fog layer is doing in a smartphone. And what cookies do in my, my browser on a smartphone. Because cookies also do processing. Smart. They also have a smart code and they have history. They also go through the history. They also, they don't go through the all history. They go through the recent history only. So they do something like that. But I, like, so I'm trying to understand what are the similar, are, does the fog computing use its cookies? I honestly, I honestly cannot give a definite answer. But it is possible, it is possible that the cookies are acting as fog layers in some application. It depends on the application design, actually. Okay. And uh, yeah, I think I've had this question before. Uh, the question, one of the questions I had during my um, thesis defense was, what is the clear difference between the fog layer and the cloud layer? I think fog, fog computing is still like it's a new thing and it's still not very clearly defined. But one of uh, the only main, the only main, uh, <clears throat> the main clear, the distinct uh, characteristic that I notice is uh, the location awareness. You know, for cloud distributed systems, it doesn't matter if this, if the processing is done in Portugal or in Germany. So, if it's a distributed system over a network, I believe they still consider them as just nodes. But in fog computing, a processing, uh, the processing that is done in Portugal is expected to give a different result for the, to a processing that is done in Germany. Because the processing that is done to, in Portugal is location away. It's, it knows that I'm processing this data from Portugal and the result will be treated as a, data, as a processing from Portugal. I don't know if that is uh, clear, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You have more information about the other users. For example, so for the intelligent vehicle, so the intelligent vehicle company, they can collect all the uh, all the information of all the vehicles, and then they can update their um, their, their, their cloud, and then they send those uh, kind of like a bug report or uh, or some uh, accident report to the other users to share this information and to update their code. So, so it's not just one, de even if the one device is acting as the fog computing device, it yeah. can still have the data from other devices. Yes, yes. yes. And that that makes sense. We still have room for a few questions. Okay. Yeah. I just have a question that what about the reliability of the decision you take based on the fog data? Because like in cloud you have a lot of data and then in fog you have just 
some piece of it that's not time in the spoon time. Then you take the decision on real time, you set the you take mm -hmm. the decision and then you back it up from the cloud and so what's the reliability? Does it pose a challenge for the kind of application you can use it for? Because like once you take a decision like yeah, I, 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 I understand. Like <clears throat> then, this should be a design decision. If you, if, uh, if the this uh, mind into historical intelligence is actually updated in near real time, it could be real time, it could be near real time. It depends on the application. But the good thing is that the com this communication is of. Sorry, I'm not used to this. Uh, Patrick's device. <laughs> <laughs> That's Patrick's device. <laughs> Patrick, you are very <laughs> So the the good the good part of this is that depending on the application, depending on the uh, real time requirements of this intelligence, you can make this uh, communication as fast as you want. If the decision will be like will be relevant to if if the updated mind historical intelligence will still be relevant for like two minutes, then you can make this sync every two two minutes. But if you need it in like every five five seconds, this this communication can be going on every five five seconds, where this other communication can be going in parallel every one second or point something second. Just to put a few words on what uh, after is saying, I guess the question is not on the frequency at which you are processing data. It's more on how do you ensure the integrity of the decision that you are taking. Okay, the decision that I'm taking is if I have... Oh. Sorry. I'm really struggling with this. Okay, so if I have, uh, say, uh, a thousand <laughs> layers, fog layers, each of them at intervals, at the same interval, we we'll get aggregated data to the cloud, and the cloud give back, gives back my this is my intelligence back to each of them based on the data that all of them has given it. No, this is okay, but you are saying that instead of going to the cloud, you are taking the decision from the fog itself first, and then you like you you propose a decision to the user. Yes, the, the intelligence. Device. And mm -hmm. then you send the data back, and you don't like you had some piece of data on your local device. You did some processing, like just based on that data, you propose something, and then you sync that data with the cloud. That is okay, but you have already proposed a decision. That's why I am saying that. Yes, the, the credibility of that decision because the, the data set was smaller. So you cannot like. Yes. Maybe the, it is okay in some cases. Yes. But yeah. in some cases. You mm -hmm. cannot rely on it because like, you don't have the old old picture. Old. So exactly the old picture. This is the this is the uh, this is the situation. Let's take our uh, average computation of average for example. I know that everything here the average. <laughs> this is not Patrick's device. <laughs> this is Patrick's. This is the way you are using it. So we know we know that uh, we know that everything here, for example, this can I use office remote? Of course. Yeah. Sorry, I I think I have another device here. I'm sorry. Is it better? Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, please, a minute. Okay, good. So, the, the point is, let's say I know that everything here, everything here, the average of everything on air is 5, and 5 is air. So I can get the average of everything here at the moment and compute it with 5, then I'll get a real-time average that is correct. Then I sync the data here up, and every other guy also sync their data up, then it computes the new average of the overall system here, then sends it back to every other guy. 
then we can still compute our average and get it right. But the 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 rate at which this mind intelligence will be like synced will depend on the uh, re the reliability or will depend on the uh, the requirements, the real time requirements of the intelligence system. If it requires all of the data also to make real time intelligence, then that means this will be syncing, this communication will be going parallel with this almost every time. But the point is, we have been able to separate the two of them so that their latency doesn't affect themselves. Then you assume that the fog layer and the, and the cloud they have both the same data, or do you have like a loop of data inside the fog itself? from the data you collect? Yes, um, the, the cloud layer has the data of every of the old system, but the fog layer has a local, its own local data for a period of time. It doesn't keep it forever. Say for, for as long as it is required, probably it needs to sync it every five seconds, every two seconds, every Yeah, but for ten. the data that you collect, Yes, so you send it to the cloud, so then you can, and then you, you sample it again to analyze it? Yes. Or you, you collect it, you process it inside, and take decisions locally on the... On so, the you the collect... Is, uh, just one thing. The thing is that the big picture is always the layer. That is the point. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you explain it, it you, you say it, but then afterwards you cut it up back again. Because the thing is that... So the big picture is always delayed, and you try to do your best with the, that big picture that is delayed, and you lock in information. Okay. So it, it has fast. to go to the cloud, so then you can take the decisions. It cannot go inside the, the fog layer, and, and then you take decisions. So you, okay. you, you, you see real-time actionable events from here, right? Goes straight to the fog. The real time, these are the real, uh, the real time, these are the events, their process and decisions are taken and this comes down. So this is the process that we are trying to actually optimize. But where this process is being optimized using for computing. But we are saying that we can also have a concurrent communication up there to make sure this intelligence is up to date and is integrated in this decision making so we can make more intelligent decisions at this layer. Yeah, so my question was, so your, your, your mind intelligence module there, does it take as an input the data you collect? Then? Yes. Yes, but, but, but for that input, does the data has to go all the way to the cloud and then back again? No, no, or it, it no. goes inside? Like it goes inside the fog for decision making. Okay. Then after real time decisions have been, have been made, then this same data is aggregated over time and sent to the cloud. Ah, okay. okay. Maybe, maybe, not, maybe it's not only delayed, but also security. Maybe it's some security of yeah. privacy. There's some information you don't want to share with the cloud and yeah. only keeping. And there is one, another issue also here is that if, imagine that we have the, this fog spread throughout Europe. How does it work? If the if the fog spreads throughout Europe, Europe, Europe. Europe. So I'm here in Portugal. I'm doing something, and there is a guy in Germany doing something. Another guy in Nigeria doing something. Then, then the, the only the, the very the very the very good advantage for all of all the guys in Europe is that their real time action their real time actionable events will be treated faster and more in, in a more intelligent manner. Then the other complications will will be left to researchers. As far as I understood, there are there are concurrent processes. So you aggregate local data, and then in parallel, let's say you have this mind intelligence. So basically, you have like two concurrent processes: one that is collecting data and uploading it to the cloud, and then another one which is gathering data from the cloud and pulling it into sure. your uh, for this to work. So basically, there is. Uh, at some point, you are not taking decisions based on the actual data that you have. There is some like uh, concept of imprecise computation yes. uh, in, this, in this process where you can take decisions based on okay on the amount of data that you have, but that uh, that does not necessarily mean that it, you are taking the decision on the complete data. But there are these are as far as I understood, these are two concurrent processes exactly. that are. Basically, there are more than two. There are, I mean, I'm just saying. In my mind, there are, there are just two, <laughs> and then there is also on geographic level. Because okay. you have okay. information here. Okay. Okay. If each 
fog node does this process, these two processes concurrent, okay, then the cloud will have all the data at some point, okay, and then you can take uh, this data in your mind intelligence uh, uh, phase there. Um, yeah, but I think is that on the presentation, those small things that John talked and you talked about, it doesn't seem very clear when you see the big picture. When you present it, Simplifies a little bit too much, and <laughs> so overlooks a little bit. Yeah, I think that Mubarak focused on. But I like, I like the, the idea. The, yeah. the, the fog notes and basically left this part aside. Just a small question. Sorry. Do you have any concrete examples of who uses this technology and for what? So, in a company who uses this for some. Okay, like I said, fog computing has been widely used, but so we are proposing like make the intelligence, make it more intelligent. And like we said, the ads, uh, those people who serve ads, I'm sure Google does this. Sorry, I'm not sure if Google does it anyway. But it can be, it can be used in ad serving. We, pro we prefer the case of medical records. Mm -hmm. Using fog computing? I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure people use, I'm sure Cisco uses for computing for them to come out with it and uh, I, I cannot come up with a lot of names, authorities, but I'm sure Cisco does that and uh, what we are proposing is in this is to make it more uh, intelligent, which apparently maybe some may have done. There are other examples in other systems that can be called for, you know? Yeah, but I mean, which ones like? Like in cellular, in cellular networks, when you want to call with... If, if you want to call another user in your same cell uh, before you have to go to the central and station the and, mm -hmm. and now uh, you have the well the new standards allow you to go just to your base station uh, mm -hmm. and not to go to the all the local local local. Yeah. you use a local yes yes so there are many examples they are not called uh, for, uh, for oh. com com computer right but in fact my question is about that so I would like to know <coughs> where I can use uh, this word as a valid concept. So uh, yes. I, 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 I think everyone has an understanding of what folk can do, but I don't know when uh, we can say, okay, this is folk, folk computing, so maybe it's very sexy to use it in an article. So you say, oh, we are working on folk, on folk computing, but uh, which components are necessary to say, okay, this is folk computing, so big data, big data, uh, mm -hmm. no, Devices, IoT devices, or when and who, which component we needed to say, okay, this is for computing. Okay, let's say when you have some <clears throat> when you have some decentralized location aware computations, it's decentralized, not happening on the cloud, and it is location aware. Then uh, probably it still has another layer of computation ahead of it. Then it's safe to say. You're doing some yeah, fog computing. Is always a cloud. Hmm? So, uh, for fog computing? So it, so it most of the part, time. Sorry, sorry, this is a part of architecture. So cloud computing has very different fog architectures. Layer. He, he, I, don't, I don't want to be very categorical in the answer. I'm being completely honest here. So the, the term for computing is like an extension of the cloud. So I wouldn't know if the extension of the cloud would need a cloud every time or it can stand on its own. But it's like an, it's like supporting the cloud in most of the cases. It is not like replacing the cloud computing. Okay, but so, and, and the concept, it is defined just by Cisco? Just, okay, mm -hmm. uh, so they have used this word as for the first time and then everyone's use it maybe in different ways. So it is valid to use it? Or there is like a group, a research group that use this concept and there is a domain maybe you have to set you have to follow that domain like like i said i have actually investigated the difference personally we know at the point i got to a product like we have some cloud distributed system so what is the difference between a cloud distributed system and for computers so and the only the the main things that i can actually com come up with is that like the for for computing there's, there has to be decentralized computation and I think it has to be location aware. 
think those two things are very, very peculiar to four computers and distinct them, uh, distinguishes them clearly from ca cloud computers. Like the cloud, it doesn't care, it doesn't matter if it's location or where you can, as the same computation can happen in portal, can happen in this one. But here, the computation, uh, the computation of portal is for portal, the computation, uh, computation of this one is for this one. So I think location aware decentralization, I think those are... Uh, application specific kind of somehow. Like if you relate location with it, then you relate. Like obviously you, you know, maybe the traffic control or something like that. Maybe, 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 um, maybe not. Yeah, if if location location uh, aware system does not necessarily have to be. Yeah, the traffic example is a good one. But yeah, there are wide uh, variety of uh, that. It's just like like he said, like we're just giving very good new names. Like it's like uh, for computing would be like a the master node of a wireless sensor network sort of. Maybe just. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not very sure it's been standardized. I, I, the best of first time I read about it is this called Open for Consortium, which uh, is from some companies, okay. and they had their first event or congress last year. It was the first one. Ah, uh, okay. okay. I read so one of the emails. I think it was in our group. I don't like. There was a call. Already, think it's becoming a trend. So, so I think they have they have built up this consortium companies like uh, Cisco and I think uh, Intel and all this. They're okay. trying to build a standard. Okay. Okay. So okay. I heard this thing was open for consortium in that that congress. So that should help. So how is it was, how is it difficult to yeah. just how is it difficult to to add a new node fork node to your system? And once this is done, how? Um, how do you guarantee that uh, the, the data are not corrupted in the sense that uh, a new node that you just introduced into mm -hmm. your system will not corrupt the decision that are taken in, on, in another node, for instance? Okay, a new, a new node uh, actually it's in, it has a depending on the application, depending on the real time application we're building now. But in, conceptually, a new node can actually interact with other fork nodes using m to m uh, communication so you can actually interact with other fog nodes and uh, the decision of a new node the decisions of a new the other fog nodes can actually do two things can actually send replies to a new node and can reply uh, can send replies to a new node and can seek information from a new node but their decision is entirely uh, up to them taking input from uh, a new node so I'm not sure the question, how do you mean, like, can it corrupt it? Like trying to... Security-wise. Security-wise. <laughs> then uh, I, believe, I believe, yes, except we have to, I've not, I've not thought of that, but we have to ensure probably a data encryption standard of in, in their communication to make, sure, to make sure that they do not corrupt, they cannot corrupt each other, but can they communicate fine? Yes, they will definitely communicate to themselves. One last question, yeah. So, my question is related to the implementation. Can something about implementation? So, did you implement any of the scenario that you presented? Yeah, frankly, implementing uh, implementing a, an architecture like okay. this was not easy. I think for like a month in the thesis, I was looking for the best way to actually demonstrate okay. what what I'm use? saying. So, I later found uh, a technology called Volt DB. Okay. VoltDB, I think, is a streaming framework too. So why I chose VoltDB was uh, it has in-memory data analysis. So all the data are, pro are stored in the main memory. Fast-moving data are stored in the main memory, and you do not have to store in Hadoop data, Hadoop or all this uh, <coughs> DB cloud you platform. You didn't do that? Huh? You didn't do that? No, I didn't. I used in-memory uh, data analysis using this VoltDB application I talked about. So basically what I was able to demonstrate in both DB uh, data application was that adding, uh, adding historical intelligence does not actually increase, significantly increase the uh, latency of real-time decision on the fork. And that was the only part uh, I actually demonstrated. <coughs> basically use this VoltDB to store all the data? The so what, what I did was, uh, 
I use VoDB. VoDB has this uh, inbuilt application that uh, simulates ads, uh, serving of ads to mobile phones. Okay. So I run the, the default application that serves ads to mobile phones. So then I modify the application slightly to include user interest. So I came up with this table of user interest. Uh, this guy is interested in fashion, sports and all. Then I included it in the factors to be considered in serving these ads. Then I compared the performance of both the basic application and the, ad, the application that involves this user interest. And the, uh, there was almost maybe 0, 0.00 something seconds uh, latency overhead. So I concluded that adding historical intelligence at the fog layer, making fog layer more intelligent, does not actually increase latency significantly at the fog layer. So that was what I was able to uh, demonstrate with the approach. So let's stop here and uh, thank everyone once more.